That'll be a hell of a t-shirt. You know what? <laughs> I'm gonna ask that you leave that alone. <laughs> we are now you live. You know I got a Facebook ad. How's I, my makeup? Well, your makeup is fake. But oh, you know what? She I just gotta like put that in my mouth. Anyway, hey, 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 we recording, dude. Oh. <laughs> oh we on the air live. <laughs> no, we're not live, but we're recording. We're on the air. We're on the air. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, you're the technical man. You really? can teach me a few things while we're doing this. Really? I can teach some old school stuff. You are, wait. Yeah. I'm an old so, school dude. You are an old school dude, but you're still cool. Right. And you look good, too. Thank you. All right. So, anyway, everybody, this, like, Y'all know who it is, but I'ma still introduce him. This is David Hump, the Grinder Humphreys. Um, what radio, the scene, hair wars, yeah, uh, soul night. Uh, no, you, soul night was mine. That was Charles Hicks. Charles Hicks yeah. Okay, for a long time I couldn't tell y'all apart. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah, there's some big things down there, down on Soul Night. But yeah, I'm, I'm a party guy from way back. All right, and let me ask you a question, cause. You're the most seasoned guy that I've had on popping up on a player. I mean, like, that has run the gamut from being a, a, a DJ in the basement at family reunions to parties to just continuing to elevate your path. You are the most seasoned guy that I've ever had on here. So let me ask you, how... Give me a brief synopsis of the beginning, the middle, and where we are now. Okay, I'll try to make it brief. As brief as possible. Okay, well, we started at really Humpty Brown the name again at Oakland University back in 75 is when I started playing, doing parties. It's 1975. Okay. And then we did the college thing, the icebreakers, you know, the Michigan State, at the Deltas, you know. We did all the Happy icebreakers. Happy anniversary, Deltas. All right. And then we had a good time with that. And then I, I got down to the city and started doing my own parties and spinning clubs. JB's on Park Avenue. Then I uh, Studio 54 for a good while, at least four or five years down there. King Kai was on Friday, I was on Saturday. It was back in, I think, 1980. Went down to the studio before. And we were banging down there, and then I left the, the club scene and went on the road with the New York City Fresh Festival as an advanced promoter. That was in 84. Uh, and I uh, was out there traveling with the Run DMC, with Danny Fatboy. You know, I, I did mix in some of the concerts, like little short sets, but basically I was promoting. Okay. And we did 62 cities for three years. Wow. And I came back from there and started Hair Wars. Started doing it in the clubs. And we did it in the clubs for a long time. Didn't know where it was going, but he ended up taking over everything. Wow. And we did uh, 19, we did club name from 85 to about uh, 90. And we went on the road to LA with our first on the road hair show. And we brought, we got up, hair wars, we got up all the baddest hairstyles in Detroit and went out to LA and blew them out. Oh, and we okay. went to LA for 15 I'm years after that. We were doing every year out of LA, one two shows a year. Yeah, but I was still doing music at the same time. I was doing people's parties on cassettes and then CDs where you could pay me a fee. And you have a sound system, I get the whole party for you. I have to be there. You know, if you just have a good sound system. I'll get you the music. I'll do your shout outs for you and everything. So I did. I still do those. Yeah, your voice is so synonymous with the sound of Detroit. You and. One like Rose the and Foodie and yeah, Madison Lee. Yeah, that's some words out here. Did you about All right, it's like great. All right, okay, great. So anyway, between all that stuff, you know, it was the scene. That was started, I think, in uh. Uh, 82. I was the first DJ to mix on the scene. Nat Morris brought me in as a mixologist coordinator. That was the title. And we had a good time on the scene. And then uh, also uh, did the open up for. Um, Oh, I'm gonna go with you now. All right, I'm sorry. All right, what's up? All right, all right. Okay, like we're at Tina. Uh, That's how it happens. <laughs> we just pop up on people. Yeah, in my house. But we're at uh, we're at in my house right now. Their anniversary what show. Where you at now, man? Uh, David, uh, uh, Tina does what for your hair wash show? She, she actually now she was working backstage as a. Uh, uh, I'm stage manager, but now she's doing the film and video. She's videotaping the shows now. But she's been with Hair Wars for 13 years. Wow. And we've been doing that. So even before Hair Wars, going back to the scene days, you know, I used to open up for Mojo. I was, I was opening that for a few years. I would do, uh, he would do big parties. You know, the State Fair, Mark Building, the Bottle Boat. 
And once I did a show with him and James Brown, but I opened up, but then it was Mojo and then James Brown. It was a, it was a hell of a night. They didn't come see me, but I was there. And I had a chance to, uh, to meet and James Brown. And they I might played. not have came to see you, but they definitely Right, heard. and Mojo was late, so I played an extra hour. I was on from 8 to 10, he was supposed to be 10 to 12, 12 and 12 to 2, James Brown. So I got I got three hours. All right. And so that was one of the highlights of the of hanging with the big boys. You know, with Mojo and James Brown, you can't get no bigger than that. Nah, not here. Not I mean not really. So let me ask you a question, and I ask this of all of the DJs. And huh? You know I got mad love and respect for you. But I gotta say this to you, like I said to everybody, you can't punk out. I need your top five Detroit DJ house or techno DJs. I ain't punking out. This is, I can't tell you five. Why you keep quiet? Because see, there's so many DJs. Everybody got their own style. And if I if I say somebody better than somebody else, you know, you're not saying that they're better than anybody else. I just want to know. Everybody gets that question. And what I'm trying to see is. Okay, what I'm trying to see is I'm just nosy. But another reason is just to see how the evolution of this party scene in Detroit came about. And who do you listen to? Who do you vibe to? Not who's better than anybody because everybody has well, okay. their Let's own say my favorite DJs would probably be me. <laughs> Powell Bradley and Phil Power because they played as a tag team and they, they were good. They were like, Are you serious? The Blues Bros. They had the little Cap the hats on, the gangster hats, and they would play together. I got the climax. Felton, you really felt you ain't tell me? Yeah, it was a tag team. And they would make smooth mixes. Like they would ride records. So they were some of the best at doing that. I like them. I also like um, DJ Fingers from way back. You know, he's still doing it. You know, like like them guys are still doing it. So, um, That's three. Is that three? So I got two left. I got two left. <laughs> Let me see. I'm to think. I was in the record pool, so it was a lot of these days that I was with all the time. And it's hard to really pull a couple more out of that bunch. What? What's a record pool? Record pool is an organization of DJs. They get records from record companies so we give feedback to find out how the records do in what city. We have 50 DJs in our record pool. I was one of the original members of the record pool in Detroit. It was called. It wasn't called United Dance Music Association. It got changed to that name. It was called uh, Disco uh, Disco Record Pool. It was uh, United Disco Pool. Okay. And it was started by a guy named Nick Senecore. He was an Italian dude. Hey, it was uh, three blacks out of 30 of them. It was three blacks. It was me, Michael T, who passed away. He was the, ended up being the president of the pool after Nick resigned. And uh, Tony Hoy. Well, used to be a jazz yeah, DJ. he sure did. Yeah. On WJZZ. JZZ. So it was us three when we first started the pool in 1978. That's when the pool started. And we used to get uh, get records. You know? And I ended up being the PR director. The guy, I did all the publicity for the record pool. I had some magazines and all these trades, uh, publications that were all at the time. And doing reports with top, top hits from Detroit. So, so we were really active back then. So, how have you seen this because I know you're not really house I know that I'm not really no you really music. I play house mm -hmm. and I even used to drive to Chicago to get house back in the day I used to go to Chicago and buy that stuff and come back because it was some house he couldn't get here you had to go outside because you know, the house didn't have uh, a lot of distribution for DJs you had to okay. find us on the ground so they didn't have a budget for taking care of all our DJs so we had to go get our own sometimes but um, house I play I play dance music you know I call it fast funk um, well, you know, fast funk is like beats like 120 plus, uh, 20. but there's slow funk that's good too. Tommy Dog, Bounce It Down, uh, the Breaks, uh, Jamaica, some Jam, I'm comfortable with Jamaica, all that's around 110. It's a whole different, it's a slow groove, fast light, but it's all danceable. Yeah. You know, but then, then you got the fast stuff like the Planet Rock, Egyptian Lover. Uh, skate, give it all I you call got. it skate music. Oh, skate music is slower. Bounce and more, um, bounce roll, skate, whatever that song was. Von Mason. Yeah, Von Mason. That was 112 beats a minute. See, how you've been, you've been around, around, and who, okay, so who have been some of the cats that you've helped personally put out there or influence? 
Well, there's some of them telling me now. I didn't realize it back then. Mike Clark said I was the first one to let him spin at Studio 54. I think he was in high school. You know, I was letting people spend some time guest DJs, you know. And, uh, oh, speaking of DJs, one of them just hit me. Uh, the Wizard. And he was one of the best. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, that boy was like so fast. He played, he looked like a little kid. I had him in Studio 54 one night as a guest. And he had, we had to took the bar stool and put it in the, uh, in the booth. He knelt on the bar stool and he said, Who's that little kid? And that boy was thrown down. I mean, he wouldn't, I mean, he was playing just a little piece of a record. He never put that records back in the cover because he had time. He was just throwing, just go through records. So one time he asked me to set up a sound system for him at a party he was hired to do. So I set up the equipment and asked him, Where, where do you want the mic at? He said, Mike, I don't want a mic. So you know, the whole night just you, and you don't have no microphone with us. Somebody needs a emergency, has emergency or something. I don't need a mic. I put the mic away, back it up. But anyway, he didn't talk, but he could play. Yeah, that boy, he could. That boy was fast, and he, and he did marvelous things uh, worldwide. He was still making money, doing on the on the large scale. Doing on a big, big large with orchestras. With orchestras, yeah, I've seen that. That was that was You know, so Detroit, Detroit has really influenced a lot of this. You know, love my Chicago, love my New York, because all of us are systemic of one thing or the other, musically. That is. Yeah, but, a lot of good times on Detroit. We had a lot of good times. What would because you are seasoned. Oh. No seasoned, like a fine wine or cheese. Okay. Priceless. Definitely priceless. That sounds good. What advice would you give to the up and coming DJs or party promoters or club owners? Wow, <coughs> Let's hear some of your advice. wisdom. Okay, well, up and coming DJs, I would say put the time into it. You know, it's not. You know, young young people have things like it's instant oatmeal. You can just be a star right away. Right. You know, but it takes time. Get your contacts down, uh, meet people, but practice, practice, practice. Okay. Because you gotta know those records. You gotta know exactly. You got you gotta know it. can't be taking chances at a big party. You got to study, practice, practice, practice. So when it's time to throw down, it's gonna come natural. Because you've already familiar with all that. All right. And just and, and meet people, get around, you put your name out there, promote yourself, and give your own parties. That got something to do with the club owners. See, a lot of club owners don't like to pay these days. That's why I never work for a club. I work as a promoter. If I was spending in a club, I was getting that door or a half door at least. Right. Make my own money. Because the club owners want to pay what I thought I was worth. So I had to develop my own crowd. System and your own crowd to get so I can your move. Show. And then if a club owner would mess me over, we sort of, sometimes they would try to say, okay, we got a home crowd. Keep packing every week. We're going to move. We're going to just kick him out. And, uh, take his crowd, but you know, they tried to do that a few times. And I moved the whole crowd out of there. And I, I was getting backup plans, so have a backup plan. I, I could take a crowd and move them out in, 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 a, in a day or two. And everybody's out and I have a system to work where I can move people. I, used to, I still use regular mail. Now I got Facebook and Instagram, which just makes it easy for a lot of people, but don't forget the old school methods. I still mail for hair oil. I still mail out thousands of invitations for him. And he still has flyers. Yeah, flyers are, yeah it's real paper. Hair wars. It's physical flyers. It's something mind. you can touch. It's tangible, which makes it real. Yeah, and so don't forget the old, the old school uh, methods. All right. Okay. And, uh, and all your club owners, you got to pay those DJs. You know, DJs, you know, take it for granted because they keep people in your in your, in your your club. They, they, they can sell drinks. But you got to be a DJ to learn how to sell drinks, too. You can't just mix all night long and they never leave the dance floor and the bar is just sitting there waiting on them. So you got you to work it so I'm going to leave. I never thought about that. Give them time to go yeah. to the bar and, and then, get and what then they break want. Up, break up them couples that don't really want to be together on the dance floor for too long. I know how to do that. See, because I, That's I, a professional. I study the dance floor when, I, when I'm working and I see what's going on and I see how you can, you can break up people or you can keep them together. There's, there's, a, there's a method and art to all that stuff. Well, I'm going to wrap this up because, one, I only have 15 minutes left to All right. Well, it's it. been a pleasure. What's your pop-up? Pop-up? Popping up on a player. Although Q Popping Morgan renamed it Pulling Up on a Player. I'm thinking I like that. The Jet King just walked into the house. Yeah, so it's been a pleasure. The Jet Man. And thank you so, 
so much for letting me interview you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it, the yeah, pleasure yeah, yeah. And, and the honor has really been all mine. That's that's Detroit legacy right there. When everything is cleared and everybody is gone, the one thing that people will remember are three names for certain in the DJ world. It's gonna be Mojo, Foodie, and Hump the Grinder. Oh, if you all know, if you all don't remember those three names, and if those three names don't carry on, the Detroit D 